science, technology, we, we still haven't counted all the stars of the universe. And God says to, to Isaac, to Abraham, if you, well, to Abraham, you count the stars of heaven. If you can count them, you can count the, the children of Israel. You're going to count the, the multitudes that you'll have. That's quite a promise. That's quite a promise when you think about that. That's a hefty promise. Uh, you ever have somebody that promises you the moon and then they never come through? <laughs> well, the Lord promised the stars and he came through. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right, our memory verse for this week. Anybody uh, remember? Anybody have it? Memory verse for this week. It was an easier one. Amen. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I believe that verse, and I got in uh, on that verse. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, next week's verse, if you want to write this down. Isaiah 57, 15. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. So it's going to be a little bit wordy, but uh, who's up for the challenge, amen? We've got to challenge ourselves a little. That's good. So Isaiah 57, 15 for next week. And we'll move on from there. All right. So this morning's Bible study, we're going through the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis 26. We're going to look at the sins of the family, sins of the family, or sins that are passed down through the family. If you would, turn to Genesis chapter 26, verse 6. Genesis chapter 26, verse 6, 6 through 10. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place uh, asked him of his wife, and uh, he said, She is my sister, for he feared to say she is my wife, lest he, uh, lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. And it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety, she is thy wife, and how saidst thou she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. And Abimelech said, What is this that thou hast done? One of the people might have lightly have lying with thy wife, and thou should have brought guiltiness upon us. If you would, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for all that you've given to us. We thank you for saving our souls. We thank you for this church. We thank you for uh, those that have uh, been faithful, Lord. And Heavenly Father, we do pray that you bless the Bible study uh, and the message to come. Lord, we pray that you'd get uh, me out of the way. They, people have come to hear from you, from your word, and pray, Lord, that we get something. And I pray, Lord, if they don't get anything this morning, it will be my fault. And Lord, I pray that uh, they would get something from your word this morning. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. So here we see in the book of Genesis 26 that Isaac, Isaac who is the son of uh, Abraham, Isaac and his wife are now journeying and they're going through the land and they're going around and they're in the land of Gerar, just like um, uh, Abraham was in his life when he went down to Gerar. And he's down there, he's walking around. This is the southern border of Israel. This is the southern border of the promised land that God, have, God has given to, uh, to Abraham and to Isaac and to the seed of Israel. And they're walking around and uh, they come in contact with the uh, Philistines. The Philistines are of Gath. They're of the southern border of Israel. And Abraham has bought the, pro Abraham has bought the property on the southern border to bury his wife. If you remember uh, back in Genesis chapter 25, uh, Abraham's wife died and he bought the land from the Philistines to bury his wife. So that is the land of Israel. Um, and of course today there's still wars about where the borders of, of Israel are and uh, that southern border it belongs to Israel. And here we see that Abraham has bought it it is the land of Israel's, it is Abraham's, and it is Isaac. And Isaac is walking around in there. Uh, you ever buy a piece of property and then just walk around in it just to see it? I recently, as a few, obviously most people know I bought a piece of property, I bought a house, and I just walk around in it. it not to be goofy or anything, just to see it. Just to see what work needs to be done or what uh, looks good, what doesn't look as good. 
and it's a good thing to, to do, you know. And, and Abraham and Isaac, they, uh, they bought property that God has given to them, and they walk around in it. And here, they're walking around the southern border of the property, and uh, they come across the Philistines. And the Philistines with Abimelech, uh, something goes on here. Now, Isaac and his wife travel downward to the southern border of the promised land where uh, Gerar is. And Isaac and Rebekah together, they come across the Philistines and Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. And when asked about his wife, Isaac lies and says that she is his sister. Genesis chapter 26, verse 7. And the man of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, this is Isaac, she is my sister. For he feared to say, she is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me or Rebecca, because she was fair to look upon. Now, this sounds familiar. This sounds like something that we've read about before with his father. You know, you ever have something that you believe so strongly and you find out later that it was false, that somebody told you? Um, I grew up, obviously, with brothers and sisters. And I remember this. We would go hiking up in the woods, and my brother and sister would tell me ghost stories. How many of you had brothers and sisters that would bother you and, and pick on you with ghost stories? And, and I was young, so what did I do? I believed them. Amen. And I believed them for the longest time, and I wouldn't go up in the woods without somebody because I didn't want the boogeyman to get me. And they, li they lied to me about the boogeyman, and they said that if you go up there, you're going to get taken by the boogeyman. And uh, I believed it. And if you say something long enough and loud enough, and you, you can start to believe it. And you get other people to believe it, even if it's not true. And uh, here you see in this passage of scripture that um, Isaac believes something that's not true. And what he believes is a lie that was told to him by his father. And his father said this. His father said, well, I lie when I go down into Egypt and I go to other countries because they might kill you. They might kill your wife. Now, they might kill your wife and they might kill you, but they might not also. But you know something, this is the fear of man. I preached on and taught on this before. The fear of man is a very crippling thing. And a lot of times we don't witness, we don't do things for the Lord because we fear what other people will say, what other people will think. Because our reputation is more important than the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, and that's just the truth of our flesh. But nonetheless, Isaac believes that he needs to lie. And he gets this from somebody. Isaac falls in the same snare through the same sin as his father Abraham did. When Abraham was in Egypt, he lied about his wife. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 13. Genesis chapter 12, verse 13. Abraham speaks here and he says, Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister. Now notice that he's commanding his wife to do this. That thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Notice that this is selfish. It's about him living. It's about, he says, my soul shall live because of thee. When you're walking in the flesh, you look inwards and you look selfishly. When you're walking in the spirit, you're looking at how to help others and how to please the Lord. And notice here, Abraham, all he cares about is himself. And because of that, he's going to sin. And not only is he going to sin, he's going to command others to sin. If you will go to Genesis chapter uh, 12, verse 17. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? That's a very good question. A lot of times, now Pharaoh is a good example as Abimelech of a heathen that knows God, knows the righteousness of God, and knows the law. In the Old Testament. Don't give me this stuff that the heathen never knew. Right here you see the heathen. Uh, Pharaoh is an Old Testament Gentile. Abimelech is an Old Testament Gentile. And they know the moral code of God. And they're going to rebuke a Christian. A Christian. A, a Jew. A servant of God. Why didst thou not tell me that she is thy wife? You know something is. I believe this through scriptures. When we give account to God. God's going to question us. That's what he does with Job. You take uh, uh, the book of Job and uh, he says, I'm going, to answer, I'm going to ask you, I demand of you, answer thou me. Job had his self-righteousness. 
and the Lord's going to ask us questions. And right here, you know what Pharaoh does? He just questions. Why did you do that? Well, if you answer honestly, it's going to reveal the hideousness of your heart. It's going to reveal that Abraham did what he did because he lied. Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? That's a good question. Why saidst thou she is my sister? Why did you do what you did? So I might have taken her uh, to me to wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. He says, you lied to me. I don't know why. Why did you do it? Why did you do what you... You know, a lot of times you do things that just make no sense. <laughs> How many of you have ever seen people just go contrary to... Not even the word of God, but even to common sense. I, I was saying this yesterday. We were fellowshipping with some brethren. I said, you know what sin is? It's maddening. Sin is maddening. It causes you to do things that you ought not to do. When you live a life of sin, when you live in sin and you're away from God, you do things that are really stupid. <laughs> you, take a look at Pharaoh. Now this Pharaoh. Pharaoh suffers the ten plagues of Egypt, the, the ten plagues that God puts on him. He loses his firstborn. The rivers turn to blood. Everything is going to pot because he's not listening to God. His heart is hardened. And then he finally lets Israel go. And what's he do? He goes and follows after them. You say, what is that? It's pretty stupid. But that's what sin does. It makes us, it makes us do things contrary to sound judgment, contrary to common sense. Nonetheless, here, Pharaoh is questioning Abraham. Why, did, uh, why sayest thou, she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore, behold, thy wife, take her and go. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. I kind of chuckle at this because Egypt is a type of the world. Abraham is in the world. He's not being where he's supposed to be. And the world can't accept him, even in his backslidden state. I'm going to tell you this. If you think as a Christian, as a born-again Christian, when you backslide and go to the world, the world's going to really accept you, you're in for another surprise. I mean, I've heard stories. I've heard stories about Christians that have backslidden, gone into the world, and the world knew that they were Christians, and the world still couldn't accept them and accept their God. Uh, there was a story about a guy who went away from God, and he, he got loaded, got drunk, went to the bar. I don't recommend any of that. And he went in there, and he was uh, with a woman, and she says, you know, there's something about you that reminds me of God. <laughs> he said, what is that? When you got the hidden man of the heart in you, you're not going to be accepted by this world, even if you want to be. And you can, you can lie to yourself and say that you're going to go in this world, but you're not of this world. You're of the king of kings. And you can lose your testimony. You can get backslidden, but you're not of this world. You have a new father. And here we see Abraham is in the world. And uh, the world rejects him. The world rejects him. You know, that's a problem with a backslidden Christian. Well, I want to go back in the world so I don't fight for God and I'll get accepted by the world. You will not get accepted by this world. Once you get saved and that hidden man is in there, you're strange. This world doesn't understand you. This world doesn't know you because the world's without Christ. We might as well just live for the Lord, amen? We might as well do the right thing and have the Lord on your side. When Abraham was Gerar, in Gerar, he, he uh, lied again. He lied again. Genesis chapter 20, verse 2. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, uh, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Look down at verse uh, 13. Look down at verse... Whoa. Nope, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now... How do you pass sin through the family? And number one, you do a sin uh, enough, and then it becomes commonplace. Notice Abraham didn't just lie about his wife once. Amen. Here we see that he lied when he was in Egypt. He lied when he was in Gerar. Uh, I'm going to say this, parents, is uh, you keep doing your sins over and over in front of your kids. You know what you're telling them? You're telling them it's okay. This is okay. It's okay to live this way. It's okay to do this sin. Uh, I've seen parents where uh, they're constantly taking the Lord's name in vain, or they're constantly cussing, they're constantly doing something, and they're doing it right in front of their kids. And then they wonder why their kids turn out the way they do. You're showing them that's okay. You're showing them that's the way to live through your conduct. And Abraham, he doesn't realize it. And this is, and I want to re, I want to emphasize, this is a 
man serving God. Abraham is a man of God. He is a friend of God. And notice how he still, just because you're saved doesn't mean you can't still rule your family. Just because you're serving God doesn't mean there aren't things that can be inbred in your family that you don't realize. And Abraham is a man of God. And I'm talking to Christians this morning. I'm talking to Christian families. Christian families are being destroyed. I don't care about the world's family, the families of the world. They're already destroyed. They're already in the wicked one. I'm talking about families of born again, Bible believing Christians, churches. And Abraham is a man of God, and he's a good man. He's the one that God says, I know that he will command his children. Uh, God has the highest respect and, and uh, elevation of, of Abraham as a man. And yet, here we're going to see that as a man, he's made some mistakes with his family. Do a sin long enough, and it will become commonplace. And what Abraham is doing is he's showing his family that it's okay to lie. In this case, you know, it's never okay to lie. We know that. Thou shalt not lie. But you know what Abraham has done? He said, well, so I don't die, so I save my skin. It's okay to lie in this case. And when you do that in front of your kids long enough, then they'll see that it's commonplace and it's okay. It's accepted behavior. When you sin repeatedly in front of your uh, offspring, or in front of your offspring, in front of your kids, you imply it's okay to do. Number two, he commands sin. Abraham commands sin. Back in Genesis chapter 20, verse 13. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, this is Abraham, to his wife, this is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me at every place whither we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. You say, what is that? That's Abraham telling his wife to lie for him. Although Abraham was instructing his wife, obviously it was something that he could have been instructing his kids in. If you're going to tell your wife to do something, you'll probably tell your kids to do something like that. And he obviously believed in it. He believed in it. He said, well, this is what I do. This is how I do it. And when he answered Abimelech, it wasn't, I don't know if he even repented of this because he kept doing it. Chances are, they say that repentance after illumination is suspect, but if you don't repent at all, you don't get it. And I don't think Abraham got this because he kept doing it. If you keep doing something, chances are you think that it's okay to do it. Amen? And here we see that Abraham keeps doing the same sin over and over. Now, maybe he understood that it was a sin and it was wrong, and he had a problem with it. You know, there are besetting sins. But nonetheless, Abraham is commanding his... It's one thing to do a sin and then confess it to God, but it's another thing to command other people to do sin. And here you have Abraham telling his wife, what makes you think he wasn't telling his children? He's commanding them in unrighteousness. And this is a man that loves God. This is a man that God has high respect for. I have seen parents in this church, but mainly I, I lost parents. You know, we brought kids in here, and, and they've gotten saved, gotten their lives right. They go to camp, and they come back, and they get rid of their rock music. And, they, and they're serving God, and they're on fire for God. And it's usually a parent that tells them, you can't go to that church anymore. Fall away from church because your parents tell them to. Don't go to church. Don't go to that church. You're, you're costing me money because you're throwing away your rock music. Praise God if one kid threw away the rock music and took on the right music. Well, what is that? That's parents undermining the work of God. And, of course, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing that anybody can do. And you know what it does? It puts the kid in a position to be a, a rebel. Either they're going to rebel against their parents or rebel against God puts them in a bad situation. When Parents, when you don't do what God commands you to do, you put your kids in a place of a rebel. We'll talk about that later on. But I've seen, how many kids have I seen and, and this church will grow again and we'll bring in kids and their parents will be the ones that say, you can't go to that church. You can't. And the, and the kids want to come. They want to serve God. They want to get right. And the parents don't let them. The parents command them not to. Or the parents feed them liberal garbage because a lot of the parents aren't saved themselves or they're lost or they live in this world. Well, it's okay to sin a little bit here. It's okay to tell a white lie. 
isn't. That's what Abraham believed. Or there's no correction at all. I'm a teacher, and I see these things. I see the product of bad parenting. I see the product of bad parenting. Genesis chapter 27, verse 6. Genesis chapter 27, verse 6. Here's another thing is we let sin slide. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make, uh, make me savory meat that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, now watch what she's going to do. Therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father peradventure will uh, feel me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver. And I shall bring a curse upon me, and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go fetch me them. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory meat, such as his father loved. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of, his, of her eldest son, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. Now here you see in this passage of scripture, you have Jacob and you have uh, his mother, Rebekah. And this is Isaac, of whom we talked about, son. This is a, what I would call a Christian family, a born again Christian family. Of course, in the Old Testament, it was the Jews. And notice the mother's commanding the son to be a deceiver. Now, yes, I know Jacob gets the blessing, and I know Jacob gets blessed of God, and I know that um, getting the blessing means that he'll become uh, a, a patriarch of Israel. But it doesn't negate the fact that his mother told him to deceive. How many parents in Christian homes commanding their children to do things that are wrong? And it makes the children, it'll confuse them. It'll make them, it'll make the wrath of God upon them. It'll put the wrath of God upon them because they're going to learn to be rebels. How many children of Christian uh, families have been shown how to rebel? And they think it's right. That's the worst part about it is they think that's godly, that's spiritual, that's the way Christianity is. And God is nowhere around it. Commanded by their own parents. You say, what are we to do about it? Preach the word. Be instant in season. Live for God. And instruct people to raise their children correctly in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and not to make them twofold more of a, more of a child of hell than themselves. Rebecca just instructed her boy to lie. And to deceive. Open instruction to sin uh, has caused many children to go away from God. Notice that this is within a godly, God-fearing family, a Christian family. And just because the charade of Christianity is upon this family, you can see that the evidence of sin is all over it. Because they're not listening to God. They're not listening to the man of God. They're not listening to the word of God. How much more worldly family? How much more of the families of, of this world that they're lost and on their way to hell, they know not God. How much more falling apart are they if God's own children and God's own families are messed up? Where is, this, where is the core family? The family is being destroyed because Satan wants to destroy the family, so we're not effective in winning this world. Notice that the sins of the next generation are usually more severe than the previous generation. Abraham's sin of lying was only a half lie. It was a white lie. Remember, when Abraham lied, it was half a lie because his sister was his wife. Whereas Isaac's sin was a full lie. When Isaac lied about his wife being his sister, that was a lie. It wasn't a sister. Uh, here, there's a quote that children will do in... Uh, what parents allow their children to do, their children will do and accept. I want to repeat that. What parents allow their children to do, their children will do and accept. What do you allow your children to do, parents? 
Do you allow them to run with the, with the pack? Do you allow them to do whatever they want? Do you, do you command them to sin? Do you command it? Whatever you teach them, they're going to do. They're going to do an excel. Say why. That's how the next generation is. You sin a sin, and your children will sin that sin to a further extent. Uh, you teach them to sin, they're going to be sinners even more exceedingly. You live for God, your children will live for God even more. How do you model for your children, parents? If you command your children to sin, if you allow sin to be committed and unchecked, if you're sinning repeatedly in front of them, you're incurring the wrath of God upon them. If you will go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. And ye fathers. Notice the, the fathers. You know something in America is fathers aren't taking the position of responsibility that God has placed upon them. Just because you don't take the responsibility doesn't mean it's not yours. Fathers are failing their homes by not leading. God doesn't say mothers, and mothers have their command as well. Fathers, you're responsible. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I had a Christian and say that, oh yeah, it means that your children are going to be wrathful against their parents. That's perhaps partially true. But that's not the truth of this verse. This verse is talking about the wrath of God and being cured upon your children. That's more severe than having your children just be mad at you. Amen. Not talking about children. Uh, uh, this is not talking about the children's wrath, specifically them. But worse than that, it's the wrath of God upon the children through, and this is it, through unbelief. If you will go to John chapter 3, verse 36. John chapter 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. You believe on the Son? Amen. You have everlasting life. You're, you're, you're saved to the uttermost. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You know something is when you, uh, uh, as parents, when we live for, we model for our children what Christianity is supposed to be, what godliness is supposed to be. And if you're not showing that, you incur upon them an unbelief. And by incurring that unbelief, they don't believe because they don't see it in you. They don't see it in you, and so if they don't see it in you, how are they supposed to see it anywhere else? And so then they don't believe. They don't get saved. They don't live for the Lord, and the wrath of God is upon them. There's a lot of children where the wrath of God is upon them in Christian homes. In Christian families. And I'm talking about not mainstream Christian, I'm talking about Bible believing Christianity. There's a lot of Bible believing, uh, fundamental Christian families where the wrath of God is upon their children because the parents have neglected them. And the parents have allowed sin to enter in the camp. Your children see hypocrisy and ingenuity, they become unbelievers. God's wrath is upon them. The wrath of God is incurred upon the uh, family of the children as they have their unbelief. And then that's why uh, you see so many children that grow up in church and they sit in the pews and they sit in the uh, benches. And at 18, what do they do? They fly the coop. Say, why? Well, there is a spirit of rebellion in children. <clears throat> and it also can be accrued upon the parents, from the parents. The wrath of God is incurred by also forgetting your children. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Now I know this morning this Bible study has been heavily pushed upon the parents. The children are also responsible. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I also forget thy children. <clears throat> God's wrath <clears throat> is poured upon the children uh, but through their unbelief, and then God forgets them. Parent, and I'm talking a lot to the parents, to be selfless, to do something for a greater cause than yourself. Be a Christian and serve God for your children's sake. You say, well, that's not a good reason to serve God just for my children's sake. I ought to serve God for God's sake. Well, amen. But you know something is, uh, <clears throat> it may not be the right motive to serve God, but at least 
Now, it's like this. I've known parents that have hated each other. They've told me this. They've hated each other. But they stayed married for their children. And uh, where they needed to get right with each other and get right with God, at least they stayed together. In the wrong motive, it's better to stay together. Amen. Than to divorce. You know something? It's better to serve God for the wrong reasons than to not serve God at all. Who knows, later on you might serve God for the right reason, the Lord will get your heart right. Serve God so God doesn't forget your children. Serve God so God, uh, your children will be saved, your children will be believers. We're losing our children. We're losing our children. I know that there's more to play than just the parenting. I know there's you have a wicked world. I know your children are... Uh, have our free moral agents. I understand that, but this morning's Bible study is, is focusing on the parents. Christian homes in America are suffering as parents turn away from the biblical principles they were taught in the Bible and in church, and instead are turning to worldly to worldly uh, <clears throat> methods and liberal philosophies. Parents, you have more of an influential role in your kids' lives than you realize. I, I get this all the time because I'm a public school teacher. I get the kids more than the parents do. Or they're exposed to uh, school more than they are to their parents. And that's true, but you know something is parents have more of an influence than they realize. For example, parents get their kids after school, get them early in the morning, uh, get them on the weekends, and get them during the summertime. You know what, parent, what are you doing with your kids during that time? Are you uh, helping them? Are you teaching them? Are you instructing them? Or are you just leaving them to themselves? Parents, you have more of an influential role in your kids' lives than you realize. And here's the other thing, take control. I got this, where parents, it is not my job as a teacher to be their parents. I'm going to say that again. I've become a parent to a lot of these kids, and, you know, I, I love the kids and stuff, but they're not me. My kids. There's somebody else's kids that have been entrusted to me. But the parents have neglected their role, and that's why the government is picking it up. You say, I don't agree with the government uh, getting bigger and, and teaching our children and, and parenting them. Well, when parents have surrendered their rights over, when the parents have surrendered their responsibility, somebody else picks it up. Amen. What do you live in a society today is where the parents are failing, the government's trying to pick it up. Now, I believe godly parents are better than the government. Parents, take control. Parents, parent your children. I said this before, I'll say it again. What I see in classrooms and in public schools is the product of bad parenting. You say, oh, I... Why is my children, they, they got a medical, it's always a medical condition, always something else instead of, I did something wrong. I didn't spend enough time with them, I didn't correct them, I didn't discipline them, I didn't love them. And you have children with so many different issues, and these issues would have been easily corrected early in life if the parents were there for them. If the parents had taken their time with their kids. But yet they've turned to liberal philosophy. Um, I had to take this course and it talked about how spanking doesn't work. It can make kids more aggressive later on, studies show. You know, something is reject worldly philosophies as it goes against God's word, parents. God's word should be your rule. God's word should be your authority, not philosophy, not uh, uh, studies. The Bible says this. He that spareth his rod, Proverbs thirteen twenty four, hateth his son. Now, who are you going to believe? the state and federal government, or your Bible. Because it's going to come down to one of the two. Either you're going to fear God and his word, or you're going to fear man. And it it's going to take a time here in America where we, need, we as Christian parents, as Christian leaders, as Christians, need to stand up, be salt, and not live in fear anymore. you got parents today that are so-called Christians that... They're, world, they're living by worldly philosophies and, and uh, liberal ideologies and rejecting God's word. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chaseth him be times. I had a parent that was a Christian one time tell me, well, if I spank my kids, they'll come and take them away. 
listen, if they come and take them away, they would have already been trying to train them anyways, the, the state and, and federal government. But at least if you do the best you can in raising them, you know that you did your best that night when you go to bed at night. Make them try to take them away from you. Don't give them up. Let me say that again. Make the government have to take them away from you because you're being a good parent, because you're training them in the ways of the Lord and the, and the biblical precepts. Don't just give them over. You say, what are parents doing today? They're giving their kids over to the world. Giving their kids over to the government. Giving their kids over to their worldly philosophies. And they're not standing and delivering, and they're not training their kids the way they should be. Spank your kids when it's needed. Love your kids. Give them the godly discipline that they need. They'll thank you for it later. You know, something is when I went to the, I, I went to public school. I, you know, I had good parents that trained me, that were with me, that gave me the word of God. I praise the Lord for it. But you know, something is this. A lot of times we're so crippled by fear. Well, if they go to a public school, there's going to be a lot of worldly influence. I'm going to tell you something. I work in the public. How many of you work in the public? Isn't there a lot of worldly influence anyways? Have some starch in you. Have some backbone. It'll be okay. Perfect love casteth out. We live in fear, folks. We're, we're fearing our shadows. We're, feeling, we're fearing things instead of standing up to it in the Lord. Stop letting and following liberal ideologies that go contrary to the Word of God. Well, studies show. Are you going to go by the studies or by the Word of God? Are you going to live in fear of the studies of mankind, or are you going to trust, follow, and obey God? Just trust God. Stop living in fear. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to create enemies in this world, but it's rather to make enemies of the world than enemy of God. I'd rather stand alone with God against the world than to stand with the world and be an enemy of God. How about you, Christian? Where do you lie? It's coming a time in America where Christians can't be uh, undercover anymore. Christians need to come out and need to stand. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. It used to be when, when America was more of a Christian nation, there were Christians that uh, could blend in, that weren't real Christians, that weren't that were lukewarm, but nowadays it's not that way. You're going to have to stand out in the light and be exposed as a Christian. Because corporal punishment is hardly ever used and not used in public schools, children know that there is little that an adult will do to them physically. So if they can psychologically outwit their parents and the authorities, they can do whatever they want and get away with it. With no real consequence for actions and sins, students and kids run the show, not the adults. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. As we get further away from God, it's more run by women and children. And I love women and children. I believe in a male leader male leadership because God uh, believes in that and that's the Bible way but as we go further away it becomes the liberal agenda is run by children schools are run by children you know something is uh, you know why I didn't sin as a kid and I'm not going to say I was super spiritual I didn't sin because it frustrated God's grace you know why I didn't sin a lot I didn't like getting spanked it hurt the butt. They hurt my butt. It was good for me. You know, something is kids, they sin because there's no consequence. When there's no consequence, they can do whatever they want. You say, well, you shouldn't sin because it's not right with God. Well, that's true. But if you put a consequence, it detours wrong behavior. There's no deterrent anymore. 
it's out of control. It's out of control. Kids are out of control because parents haven't trained them correctly. Train up a child in the way he shall go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. You know the Bible says you train him from the breath. You train him right from the get-go. And you, as parents, are in control, not the children. Genesis chapter 26, verse 9. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety she is thy wife. And how sayest thou she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. And Abimelech said, What is this that thou hast done unto us? One of the people might have lightly have lined with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. The sins of Abraham. Now, I don't believe that sins are genetically transmitted. I believe that sin is, is learned, and I do believe that we have a sin nature. I don't want to get heretical. But the fathers and the, and the parents can model a lot of how the children's behavior is. Abraham was a good man. He was a good father. But there was some sin in his life that when Isaac was, um, when Isaac came in contact with it repeatedly, also developed. The heathen, like Abimelech and Pharaoh, knew that the Christian did wrong. And here in this passage of scripture, Abimelech is like the heathen, and even the heathen know what's right and wrong. The heathen know between good and evil. And this affirms that in the Old Testament, lost Gentiles knew the law and knew what they had to do to be converted. Amen. There's no excuse. There's no excuse for those to not get saved, to not get right with God. And any dispensation in any time period of any person. And I will stand here and deliver that faithfully. I was lost. Sure, I grew up in a Christian home, but I still had to get saved. I still had to repent of my sin. I still had to trust Christ. Anybody can do it, but it's so simple. The heathen, like Abimelech, knew that the Christian did wrong and affirmed in the Old Testament that the Old Testament Gentiles knew the law of God. It shows the lack of Christian testimony being showed by Abraham and Isaac. You know what Abimelech has run into is two generations of Christians that didn't do right <laughs> in type. I know they were Old Testament Jews. You know something? Us Christians, we keep showing the world the wrong way. They're not going to want to be converted. They're not going to see a change. They're not going to see anything new in us. But you live in the, you walk in the spirit, and you do the things that God commands. The world will see that. They may hate your guts for it, but they will respect you, and people will get saved. To avoid the sins, uh, parents are uh, allowing their kids to pick up, train your kids not to follow you, but to follow you in Jesus Christ. And I had the verse, but I didn't uh, put it in. But Paul says, as you see me do, do as I follow Christ. We need to train our children to serve the Lord. We need to train them uh, in the ways of God as we live for God. Make Christ the preeminence in your life, and your children will see it, and will put Christ as the preeminence in theirs. Any questions on this morning's Bible study? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the Bible study, Lord. Thank you for your word. Lord, pray you bless the uh, message you follow. And pray, Lord, for uh, the growth of, of this church. Lord, we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen.